webinar series. So INIAS Kolkata and uh, Bhubaneswar chapter, INIAS Kolkata Bhubaneswar chapter and IIM Bhubaneswar chapter welcome you all in the first and inaugural session of the webinar series named Advances in Material Science and Engineering. We all know that material science is ever evolving field of research and it is accommodating a broad discipline of expertise. So we must accept that seminars plays an important role uh, in discussing cutting edge research ideas, innovations and technologies. And uh, since pandemic, pandemic time, we have uh, got an alternative of seminar that is webinar. Now, uh, webinar has its uh, different kind of uh, reach because we can uh, use this social media platform and other things. So this webinar, importance of webinar cannot be denied now. So now coming to the uh, uh, like significance of this webinar uh, series. Uh, uh, so in this uh, webinar series, in each uh, have Mukherjee from IIT Kharagpur. And the second talk uh, will be delivered by a student or uh, research scholar, maybe postdoc. And uh, so why we have kept this kind of uh, structure? Uh, because we felt that uh, sometimes uh, students lack proficiency in verbal communication. And because of that, uh, sometimes they lack uh, confidence. So many students, uh, they hold good degree and uh, skills. However, uh, sometimes they are behind by expressing themselves. So we thought to provide the students a platform where they can express uh, their research findings. So now uh, I am uh, thankful to all of you uh, for joining us. And now I'm handing over this Zoom safe, uh, platform to my Ineos colleague, uh, organizer of this webinar series as well. Uh, he is co-coordinator of Kolkata Bhubaneswar chapter. And uh, he is a faculty from Indian Association of Cultivation of Science, Kolkata, Dr. Praveen Kumar. So Praveen, you may proceed now. Yeah. Thank you, Suparna. And I'm very thankful uh, uh, for our speakers, both of the speakers uh, who has, uh, you know, agreed to give a first uh, inaugural. Robin, you are muted. So now I'm audible? Yes, yes. So thank you, uh, thank you, Suparna. And uh, thank you uh, very much for our both of the speakers for accepting uh, our invitation uh, to give a talk. So what I'll do, I'll uh, give a very brief about uh, INIAS and also I'll try to take you a short journey for our Kolkata Bhavishya chapter. So we are uh, the Young Academy of India. We only are the Young Academy of India where uh, we, okay, where uh, uh, it has been, uh, you know, uh, conceptualized, conceptualized by for 20 members who was having this uh, India Asian scientist in uh, 2014. Then we grown up. Uh, now we have around 102 members uh, active and 44 alumni. If I go for the structure, so we generally have a, a chair which has a tenure of two years and we have a nine CC members. So this is what uh, the core uh, uh, actually uh, structure where we work on and uh, all the members can give their suggestion or uh, whatever the event they wanted to implement according to the vision of INYAS. What so? Uh, by having the um, mission for engaging interdisciplinary and uh, intergenerational dialogue of, on scientific issues. So we have found out several visions like uh, promoting science, education, outreach activities, networking among young scientists across the India, supporting young scientists in career development and independence, building scientific temporal across the country, and collaboration with the other young academies. Okay, like uh, we have in India, other similar wise, we have every other country has a different young academy. So we provide uh, uh, the path as well too, so that we can have a more networking uh, throughout uh, the globe. 
so we have uh, several key achievements uh, out of uh, them few we have listed here like the representation of uh, national science academies so, so our members uh, alumni has all the representation so we are very active in uh, scientific collaboration and uh, we are participating uh, worldwide for uh, different young academies as well so we some of our members are the part of the global young academy and of course uh, you will find out uh, uh, our alumni or our existing members has a uh, Passed lot of awards, uh, particularly uh, Sir Jayanti Fellowship and Bhatnagar Award, and they are also in various editorial board members at the international reputed levels. So this is where we are uh, having a good uh, knowledge uh, as well. And apart from that, we have a several initiatives by which we try to convey, we try to connect with not only uh, with the young minds of India but also with the uh, several other research uh, or uh, several other policy makers. Like we have a uh, one net post uh, where uh, it's a unique platform for the young uh, young scientists, where we try to brainstorm for various scientific issues. We are uh, editing uh, since last three four years a uh, special issue of Insta Insta. Uh, I am uh, recently uh, for one of the editors for that, and we have a see we we have a newsletter of Inyas every year we publish, and that newsletter we publish in multiple languages so that uh, it, it is easier to disseminate. Uh, our uh, ongoing activities around the globe we celebrate the national science day a lot of uh, technical symposium workshop also we do we do lot of uh, outreach act activities we do lot of science camp we also go for remote uh, area and uh, uh, one of our the you know uh, the event is very famous like ru shetu where we are going to uh, very rural areas we are going to have uh, this school children school teachers so that to educate them how to get the uh, you know advanced teaching and that's all So we try to go everywhere, whatever, wherever we can benefit the, the community and also, especially the school kids and uh, the college uh, students and teachers. So uh, coming to the local parts, because uh, as a Nias, we can go and uh, we can discuss a lot more in uh, urban area, or we can find out some central institute. But we cannot go to the regional level. So that is where Nias has um, uh, form, formed uh, seven chapters, and uh, uh, in this Kolkata Bhuneshwar chapter is one of them. and the, the idea of having these chapters to go more regional so whatever activity we are doing at the national level as enias these four levels take those activity into the regional level so that um, more members or more uh, uh, you know dissemination can happen in a very effective way so kolkata bhumlish chapter uh, is one of them we have eight members uh, uh, dr kutubuddin mola is a coordinator so i am working as a co coordinator and fortunately we have a two cc member uh, in the nias from our chapter uh, dr nishan chakravarti and uh, dr shripana chatterjee uh, who fortunately is uh, the organizer for this event as well we have conducted uh, a lot of uh, events in covid time as well which has gained lot of attention like uh, one of them miles to go so there uh, we have a very uh, you know series of the seminars to educate of uh, uh, you know to uh, inculcate lot of information among the uh, you know uh, general public and also to uh, educate them related to different various issue and we have uh, uh, also conducted a uh, event like uh, intellectual property patents where uh, we try to uh, tell the researchers or uh, college or school students sorry uh, college students how to uh, take care of these uh, uh, right when they are going to write uh, uh, any patent or other related issue we have uh, uh, genticals uh, where uh, we have uh, Use uh, this uh, to understand the basics of the genetics. Uh, how these uh, concepts are uh, changing the paradigm of modern day uh, healthcare, so, and also we have a bioscope. Okay, so these all uh, seminars uh, series we have where we get a lot of attention, uh, a lot of uh, interest in part of uh, from the various groups. Recently, we also conducted the career counseling where uh, we uh, gone through the school students and um, teachers so that uh, we can tell them what are the opportunities available for them. so that was a very a very good interactive interacting session for us as well and then uh, we recently we started uh, the activity the med bandhan where uh, we are uh, trying to get a lot of doctors so that uh, the common people can interact directly with them and uh, can get a real suggestion what uh, they require for different uh, related to different diseases as well and uh, uh, one of our uh, member is uh, trying to go to farmers and try to uh, ask them what uh, how scientifically we can help them how we can solve a lot of problem which is having with them scientifically uh, so because uh, the rural rural farmers doesn't know about uh, uh, these scientific uh, uh, solutions 
So we are now trying to reach uh, to them as well. So coming uh, to the uh, proposed activities, what we are going to do, um, we are uh, focusing a lot on medical issues. So that's what we have started the, uh, the healthcare awareness. Uh, where we are um, trying to get to medical camps. And the uh, uh, second activity which we propose uh, to have a science camps so that we can engage the high school students with the excitement of uh, science. Uh, so we all as an INIAS member and a Kolkata Bhunisha uh, chapter member, we go to them and we try to engage with them. So to make uh, science easy to them so that they can understand, they can inculcate the science, they can understand the science so that uh, they get, get the thrust to of that science in their career. We are also working uh, with the farmers as I told you, and uh, uh, recently we have started a, a new series which we are going to start how we can utilize this uh, electronics uh, for fun so that uh, you learn more in an appropriate way so that uh, uh, tomorrow if you wanted to opt this uh, as a uh, subject it will be very you know, knowledgeable or beneficial for you as well. So of course we are doing a lot of science camp and we are also organizing uh, a research under the chapter activity. So this is uh, going to benefit for the school students and also school teachers. So by which uh, we can at least uh, um, encourage them, motivate them to offer the science as, a, as their career. So with that, I'll stop here. And uh, you can always visit our INYAS case site uh, and uh, uh, you can have uh, very much interaction anytime, any of the problem which you are facing related to the science or any activity. Thank you very much. Shripanna, over to you. Uh, thank you, Praveen. So I think uh, as this uh, webinar is uh, a joint uh, event of INIA's Kolkata Bhubaneswar chapter and I am Bhubaneswar. So now I would like to uh, uh, introduce you to I am Bhubaneswar chapter of his, of his bearers. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. I am S.K. Uh, yeah, sir. Yeah. I am so, chairman of uh, I am Bhuvanesha chapter. I welcome uh, all on behalf of I am Bhuvanesha chapter for this uh, very good initiative. It's a very good initiative, and people, people learn and people also share their experience. And uh, and by talking to these intellectuals, we can improve our th thought also. <coughs> so that is a very good initiative. And I am regarding uh, the activities of uh, our chapter uh, that was supervised by. Uh, he is the secretary of this uh, chapter. He will uh, show some slides. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Yes. So now we would request uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Bajfi to present activities of IIM Bhuvaneshwar. Yeah, so uh, is it visible? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so very. Good evening to all of you. Thank you, uh, sir. Yeah. Dr. Bajpi, uh, can you just make it in PowerPoint mode? Means now it is in uh, slideshow mode. Yeah, perfect. Please. Ah, yes. okay. Yeah, so thank you once again, uh, Dr. Sriparna uh, and uh, sir also, Tripathi uh, sir. Uh, very good, of, uh, good, of, good evening to all of you. Myself, uh, Shukra Bajpi, and the secretary of uh, I am Bhubaneswar chapter. I will just take a uh, few minutes of uh, all of you just to make aware about uh, our activities. Uh, we will uh, introduce you to IIM and I am Bhubaneswar chapter. So uh, the activities that we have done in the recent time as well as in, the, in some past few years, though it was a difficult uh, pandemic time. So yeah. So. Uh, yeah, so uh, we are the part of uh, institute called institute, Indian Institute of Metals. Uh, the history goes back to year 1947 when it was established with the 42 members. Presently, the institute has 10,000 members and mainly uh, the institute uh, works in the area of metallurgy and the materials engineering. Uh, the, uh, the headquarter is, uh, is situated in uh, Kolkata. Uh, it has uh, approximately 45 members, uh, 45 chapters at present and uh, 10 student chapters as well uh, and dedicated student chapters. 
and uh, it uh, it does a lot of activity as i said in the area of uh, metallurgy and materials engineering by means of conducting various activities uh, uh, some of uh, them i think uh, are listed here and it the uh, uh, institute itself has its own journal and that is known as the transaction of indian institute of metals it uh, publishes uh, uh, time to time uh, book series and uh, a monthly metal news magazine uh, as well as it has uh, it conduct uh, uh, every year a uh, flagship program called uh, nmd atm which is an international conference uh, followed by the celebration of metal, uh, national metallurgist day uh, now uh, switching over to the i am bhubaneshwar chapter activities we were uh, we came into existence in year 1976 uh, at uh, imnt bhubaneshwar uh, uh, as the location, uh, we have various scientists, academic, academy, academia, engineers uh, from various meeting organizations as a part. And we have a student number from IMT, IIT, and KEEP. Uh, currently, we have more than uh, 100, uh, 226 uh, life members, uh, total members, and the life members are around 211. Uh, we uh, also uh, give three awards each year. We nominate uh, those are listed here. That is Bhubaneswar Chapter Award, Arthur Memorial Award, and the SK Kamotia Awards. These awards are basically in, in a specific area, uh, as listed here. Uh, we do conduct uh, over the year uh, online seminars, offline seminars, I am metal quest for especially for the school children. Uh, conference courses, training, workshop, uh, and uh, industrial visit for the chapter members. These are some activities uh, in last two years that were conducted here in our chapter. Uh, mostly are online. Uh, the first one, as I can, uh, this is uh, the celebration of Indian Day. There, Dylan, uh, president of uh, IIM, uh, Professor Amul Gokhale. Uh, Gave a lecture on the role of critical metals in building national economy. We had a membership drive among the uh, college students. Uh, we had uh, a separate award ceremony for our uh, awards to distribute. Uh, we had uh, IAM completed its 75 years uh, the last uh, like uh, the ongoing year and uh, they were holding a platinum jubilee webinar series so we were we as a chapter was first to hold that webinar uh, and so uh, dr samit kumar Ray, director s and uh, national center for basic sciences kolkata delivered that lecture uh, we celebrated world environment day uh, we had a webinar lecture given by Dr. Anil Kumar Chaube on Noble Lightweight Magnesium Alloy, the Method of the Future. Uh, we conducted uh, last year's AGBM in the month of November, where uh, the various lectures and award ceremonies etc. was uh, compressed. So, with this, thank you. We have a website also uh, of our uh, chapter that is uh, www.imdsr.in. With this, uh, uh, with this short introduction and presentation, I thank you all for uh, patient listening. And now uh, over to Dr. Shivarna. Thank you, Dr. Vajpayee. So now I'll hand over this uh, session to Chiroshree and to introduce uh, Professor Mukherjee. Yeah. So thank you, Mr. Shubra, for a uh, wonderful introduction of the IIM Ubaneshwar chapter. Now, it is my pleasant duty to welcome Professor Obhidrata Mukherjee uh, to start this lecture session. He's already very popular in the field of soft patterning, soft nano patterning, and I am sure that he needs no introduction. But uh, as, as an official procedure, I need to introduce him formally. So he's presently a professor at the Department of Chemical Engineering and IIT Kharagpur. He obtained his uh, bachelor's from Jadavpur University, MTech from IIT Kharagpur, and PhD from IIT Kanpur. And he is an internationally recognized expert in soft nano patterning and thin film instability with specific emphasis on ordering 
and arranging objects by confined cell organization at the mesoscale. He's also an expert in the field of atomic force microscopy, particularly imaging soft surfaces. So he has got plenty of international publications with sufficient number of Indian patents. He's an extremely popular teacher at IIT Kharagpur and uh, presently is setting up the DST funded Sophisticated Analytical and Technical Health Institute at Satya Dietical Kharagpur. So with this brief introduction, I would request Professor Mukherjee to take over the session. Thank you, Chirashri, for formally introducing me. That was real fun. Okay, uh, so thanks to the organizers, uh, Sriparna mainly and other office bearers present here from INEAS and uh, IIM Bhubaneswar chapter for inviting me for this uh, very interesting webinar series. I do not know whether why I was invited uh, in a, a meeting for the young scientists, uh, where you call somebody very old and you just tell him that you have to talk to the stellar young kids, which is a challenge. So let's see. Uh, and uh, so I shared the screen, I guess. I'm not very comfortable in Zoom. Uh, so can you see my slides now? Right. Yes, it's perfect. Uh, I would also like to specifically welcome and thank uh, uh, Professor Batish for joining from Dhaka, Bashit for joining from joining from Dhaka, though I, I sufficiently warned him that you are going to be extremely bored. That's a wording that I have issued to Sriparna also, but, uh, despite that she never listened to me. So what I'm going to talk is sort of a very simple uh, talk on the type of work I do. It's not exactly uh, taking up one specific problem or anything like that. I'll be very happy if uh, some of the some of the participants, some of the colleagues, some of the students, you just carry home something that is very, very interesting. I'm going to talk on polymer thin films. And if you look at my title, you see that two of the words are highlighted in different colors, polymer and thin. So let us try to find out what I'm going to talk about. So my talk is centered around the fact what exactly is meant by thin films. A bit of relation to nanoscience. We are all very excited about nanoscience and nanotechnology, which sort of uh, promises to do a lot of wonder or have been doing wonders for a while. Uh, why also I picked up this polymers, that is something which is related to materials, and I, I will talk about it. And then a little bit of thin film hydrodynamics and debating some recent examples from mainly from our group and some concluding remarks. I do not want to make this uh, topic or lecture very scientifically heavy. So I'm going to talk in very simple terms so that it's understandable to everyone across disciplines. If anyone is interested to go deeper or probe deeper, feel free to touch base with me later. So I don't think I need to talk much about uh, to this audience, at least, about what is so special about nano. Everybody knows what is nano, even to a first year student, if uh, or if even a school student, if we ask what is nano, everybody will give an answer, 10 to the power minus 9 meter, which is fine. But I always try to give everybody a personal, uh, a sort of a feel of how small are we talking about. So if you think of human hair, for example, human hair, roughly, depending on whether your hair quality is good or bad, it is some, somewhere around its diameter is 50 to 70 micron. So when you are talking about something like five nanometer, you are essentially talking about one ten thousand, the width of one human hair. That's the uh, type of size you are essentially talking about. And let me also highlight that a typical inorganic molecule is considered to be about an angstrom. So if you are talking about a one nanometer length, you are essentially talking about roughly 10 uh, molecules, which uh, if arranged in a series will roughly lead to about a nanometer. So uh, one very unique thing of nano, which is very, very well known to the scientific community is essentially the finite size effect, which uh, is the quantum confinement effect, you can say. And I'm sure people uh, who have some scientific background in this particular area or materials, you see this type of pictures very, very commonly. This is uh, semiconducting um, some quantum dots uh, of different size. And if you excite them with UV light, they emit color at different length scale. So essentially what happens is as you keep on making things very, very small, uh, the defect states change or the band structure starts to change. And as a consequence, uh, intensive properties, which are generally size independent, becomes a function of the size itself. For example, for quantum dots, the, their color, or the, their emission depends both on their size and shape. Uh, 
This is something that is quite well known. And you also, we also know about the zero dimensional material, that's the quantum dots, the one dimensional material, that's the nano wax or rods, and the two dimensional materials, which are the 2D materials like graphene and stuff like that. Uh, however, what I'm going to highlight is the other aspect of nanoscience, which is not often appreciated that much by many of us. And that is, it is also the length scale which is predominantly or which is dominated by the intermolecular forces and the gravity is almost absent. So what exactly I mean by this intermolecular forces is essentially the good old van der Waals interaction. Uh, it's the induced dipole or the dipole dipole or multiple multiple interaction between adjoining atoms and molecules. And of course, the most general form of this interaction is the induced dipole induced dipole type London dispersion forces right, which is present irrespective of the exact structure of the molecules or the atoms, right. In fact, they are responsible for integrity of all the materials and the structures like rigid of the solid objects, they retain or even liquids take a spherical shape or a meniscus, everything is responsible actually for this Van der Waals interaction. So it is probably also well known that this strength of this interaction scales as one by R to the power six or one by X to the power six, where X is sort of, or X or R is the intermolecular separation distance. And the separation distance is from nucleus to center of the nucleus to center of the nucleus. So this is the 612 potential or the Lennard Jones potential. So in, if you bring two atoms or molecules from an infinite separation distance close to each other, roughly when they, they come closer to by around 10 nanometer or something like that, they start to sort of induce, uh, they start to induce. And once they come very, very close, the outer orbital, the electronic orbital starts to physically overlap. And there is a very, very strong physical uh, the electrostatic repulsion, which is the bond repulsion, which is this very, a steep repulsive regime, which essentially scales as one by R to the power 12. So this is probably quite well known to the scientific community, uh, maybe based on these numbers. I'm not an expert in this area. Please understand that I'm not a physicist. I'm just an engineer by training. So typically it, it turns out that this induced dipole, induced dipole type non-retarded Van der Waals interaction sort of stretches arguably up to 10 nanometer. Maybe that is also on the higher side maybe few nanometers. So only when the molecules or the atoms are very close to each other, they can experience this interaction. Now, uh, though we talk about interaction between molecules and atoms in real life, what happens in most of the times that individual of single molecules or atoms are not interacting with each other. Uh, incidentally, this uh, signature of this Van der Waals forces is very well known to the scientific community. Even uh, students who are just learning basic thermodynamics just when we start to talk about the modification or the improvement of the ideal gas law in the form of let's say Van der Waals equation of state, where you have a correction pressure correction term P plus A by V square into V minus B equal to RP, this A by V square term actually originates because of these intermolecular interactions. I'm not going into that detail, but it's just very, very simple. So any engineering or science students actually know about its signature. Coming to what happens in reality, in most cases, uh, the situation is that more than the interaction between individual molecules, what we actually have is interaction between two surfaces, right? For example, when an atomic force microscope tip is approaching, or even when, when your two hands are coming to clap, two surfaces are coming in contact. And if you assume that at contact, the separation distance Actually, the separation distance is never zero. It is some d0 because of this electrostatic repulsion. Uh, when two surfaces come in contact, there is actually a range during which just ahead of complete contact, there is an active Van der Waals interaction. So one can do a little bit of mathematics. So essentially what happens is this block has molecules or atoms. This block also has molecules or atoms. So when you are looking at their collective interaction, there is actually the cross interaction between all the molecules of block one with all the molecules of block two. And that leads to an additional or enhanced strength of this Van der Waals interaction between the two surfaces. I'm not going into the mathematical detail. And what turns out is that the energy of interaction per unit area uh, scales as something like, uh, like this, uh, where essentially you have two blocks of uh, dimension or width d1 and d2, which are separated by a distance d, 
So you see the, in the, the expression here, this A is called the Hamaka constant. It's a material dependent property. And what you have, so instead of, uh, if both the blocks are thick, which is in most cases the situation, what will happen that D1 and D2 will independently tend to infinity. And out of these four terms, only one by D square will remain active, right? So uh, these all these four terms will be active only when the blocks are very thin, as well as the separation distance between the two blocks is very low, that is D is very low. Because if the two blocks are far away, of course there is no effect of one block on the other one, and therefore this whole GLW term is going to be zero. I hope it is clear. So only take home message is that uh, when we are talking about the interaction, Van der Waals interaction between two surfaces, right? what happens is, uh, uh, what happens is the scaling changes from one by r to the power six to one by d squared, the scaling becomes parabolic. And what it means is that the interaction stretches beyond this 10 nanometer limit, arguably roughly about 100 nanometer. So that is uh, what is interesting uh, when we are talking about the Van der Waals interaction between two surfaces, and this is often over. So what does it, what does it mean in the context of a thin film? So I think what I mentioned, if it is making some sense to you, I'll just summarize. It turns out that this GLW, which is the energy of interaction per unit area, is non-zero only when D is lower than 100 nanometer or something like that, or the two surfaces are close to each other, very close to each other. So we have an expression for this interfacial interaction. And now let us try to understand what it means for a thin film. So you see, essentially, what type of thin film are we talking about? This thin film, please remember, is a very interesting term. So whether 50 nanometer is thin or five micron is thin, it also depends from context to context, from scientific area to scientific area. For example, if you are looking into the domain of photovoltaics, people confidently say few micron thick films are thin films. But the type of work that I'm going to talk about, we consider thin film to be something based on a completely different criteria, it turns out the film thickness is about lower than 100 nanometer or something like that. So you see, essentially, the type of thin film we are talking about is what is known as a supported thin film. It's like a coating. Because please do understand, you can also have a self-standing thin film, which is another type of a thin film I would put it. And an example would be the surface of a soap bubble, because it is not resting on any rigid surface, but it's still a thin film. So what we do here is that, uh, we can easily convert, at least with our concept, uh, this figure into this uh, a thin film or a supported thin film, where uh, we just, uh, what I have done here to demonstrate how it can be mapped, you just rotate the figure by 90 degree to the right. So you have a separate, you have a figure like this. And what you can say, the support is very, very thick. It's the substrate we call. So D1 tends to infinity. D is now, the film is coated right above the support. So it is the minimum separation distance. It is D0. And this D2 is the film thickness, which is H. And one can do a little bit of mathematics and show that the GLW of the film is equal to the negative of the GLW of the interfacial interaction. Because please remember the expression that we had is for interfacial interaction. And it turns out that the excess free energy of a film, ultra thin film uh, is equal to the uh, interfacial interaction, the, uh, the uh, free energy uh, due to the interfacial interaction. There's a little bit of mathematics which I'm deliberately avoiding. So I think uh, the take home message that I will carry is that if you have a thin film, which is very, very thin, how thin? If H is below 100 nanometer, that is, it is the range where you know that there is going to be active interfacial interaction between two surfaces, then such a film has some excess free energy or excess energy. And the extent or the strength of this excess energy is a function of the film thickness itself, what you can see. Of course, in this expression, so in this whole slide, this expression is the only important expression. So you can see that if the film starts to become thicker, right? So H starts to increase, the GLW excess free energy will tend to zero. And we also understand that if you have two films of the same material, let's say 20 nanometer and uh, 40 nanometer, since H is lower for 20 nanometer, the excess interaction, excess energy is going to be higher. 
i hope it is making some sense to all of you but let's see so in simple terms i think this is where uh, all of you will understand that uh, in our context there is virtually no difference between a 50 micron film a 5 micron film or a 500 nanometer film but a 50 nanometer film is different and the reason for this difference is due to van der waals interaction or there is one can say active van der waals interaction between the two surfaces or the two interfaces of this thin film that is the free surface of the film and the film substrate interface so a film so the take home message that i'd like to convey is that a film that is thinner than 100 nanometer will have some excess free energy due to the non zero or active interfacial interaction between the two interfaces so we will define a film to be a thin film in our context if for a supported film there is active interfacial interaction between its two interfaces now i would like to draw your attention to another type of system and that is a stagnant liquid layer so when we look at a tank full of water or a glass full of water uh, there is no uh, driving force for any flow so we feel that uh, the fluid velocity or the particle fluid particles are actually at rest and then there is uh, no motion everything is static however because of the internal kinetic energy of the molecules so what happens is uh, there is always some fluctuation at the liquid surface now this is actually visible or more prominent in case of a liquid we all know about these fluctuations in a completely different context because we know for a liquid layer evaporation always takes place at any temperature and what is the genesis for that though we say that the internal kinetic energy the average translational kinetic energy of the molecules is kb into t that is only the average value there is always going to be some distribution of kinetic energy of these molecules within the liquid layer and uh, the molecules which have higher energy will actually have a tendency to slip out from the liquid layer and move to the vapor phase that's exactly the reason why when you start increasing the temperature of a liquid pool the rate of evaporation essentially increases because the probability of finding a molecule with higher level of kinetic energy increases but for a liquid layer at room temperature what happens is these fluctuations are also associated with something interesting and that is what is known as laplace pressure i don't know how many of you know the exact pedagogy of laplace pressure but it simply means that if you have a fluctuating interface it is associated with the corrugation of the surface or enhancement of the surface area and we all know that surface tension tries to minimize the surface area therefore surface tension tries to flatten it out so now onwards whenever you look at a free liquid surface which is static you please realize that the steady state prevailing at the liquid air interface is not a stationary steady state but it's a dynamic steady state so there is always this fluctuations because of the kinetic energy of the molecules unless you are looking at a liquid layer at absolute zero so because of the fluctuation there is kinetic and because of the kinetic energy of the molecules there is always some fluctuation and those fluctuations firstly it's a high frequency low amplitude fluctuation so compared to a the glass which may be having a depth of 20 cm this 2 nanometer 3 nanometer or 5 nanometer amplitude makes no sense a tank of water it makes no sense and it is also opposed by this laplace pressure uh, or the surface tension and therefore apparently the liquid remains perfectly flat now we are talking now if we if we talk about a liquid thin film so since it's a liquid layer the same physics of this fluctuation happens there also now two things happen if we are now taking a thin film which is thinner than 100 nanometer there is actually a non zero interaction between the free surface and the liquid a solid substrate and we also know that the strength of this interaction is a function of the film thickness so earlier in case of a macro uh, the uh, thick layer or a thick pool of liquid these fluctuations had no reason to grow right but here what happens if we look at one fluctuation amplitude like this let's say the initial film thickness was h1 and uh, the because of the fluctuation the local thickness is h2 and we again go back to this uh, gl expression of glw excess free and excess energy of a system because of its thinness and we find it uh, it's ae by 
pi h square a is the Hamaka constant. I'm not going into the details of that. And if we just find out the differential of this term, which is phi LW, which is del del H of GLW, or in other words, how the free energy of the system changes with change of film thickness, right? So this term phi LW is often referred to as the disjoining pressure or effective interface potential. And what exactly this means? So if we just look in very simple mathematics, it means that if the initial film thickness was H1 and the final film thickness is H2, so it essentially gives the, the difference between GLW when the film thickness is H2 minus GLW when the film thickness is H1 divided by H2 minus H1. Now kindly look that since we are examining the depression of one fluctuation amplitude, H2 minus H1 is always negative in this particular case. And if GLW H2 minus GLW H1 is also negative, then this term is going to be positive. So under what condition GLW H2 is going, so what it means is that this is a situation where GLW H2 has essentially reduced, right? It, it has reduced, uh, so sorry, uh, I, we, let, us, let us take an example of phi LW is negative. So that is positive since the denominator is negative, the numerator has to be positive. Or in other words, that means that GLW H2 is greater than GLW H1. That means that because of this fluctuation, the free energy of the system has increased. And we all know that thermodynamics or nature does not, uh, a process never migrates to a direction where the free energy increases. So if this phi LW is negative, that means that the growth of this fluctuation is not thermodynamically favored. And if you look into the expression over here, you will find that a negative value of phi LW is only positive, only possible when AE is negative because H is the local film thickness and it's always a positive quantity. So what I mean to say that in simple terms, that if the interfacial interaction between the free surface and the substrate film interface is attractive, then, and if the strength of it is higher than the stabilizing influence of surface tension, then these fluctuations may not subside in an ultra thin film and can grow with time. And if this fluctuation grows, then what is going to happen? Eventually, this growing, the amplitude of this growing fluctuation matches the film thickness and the two separate interfaces eventually merge forming a hole, right? So I'm coming back to this slide. So let us see what exactly happens for a system which is thermodynamically unstable. I know this part is a little heavy physically as well as mathematically, let's not get into that. All we understand is if the interaction between the two interfaces is attractive, there is a possibility of the fluctuations to grow. If the interaction between the two interfaces is repulsive, then of course, as soon as the surface tries to come to this other interface, it is repelled, surface tension anyway tries to stabilize it, so the film remains stable. And if the film is thermodynamically unstable, see what happens. So all you have taken is a spin-coated ultra-thin film of a polymer, which is in a liquid form, and you just heat it above the glass transition temperature, and you see the film completely ruptures eventually into isolated droplets. So this is uh, what I explained is the physics of spontaneous instability in an un unstable film, but this is, remember this manifests only in a liquid film. So what are the necessary criteria for this, for a film to become unstable? The necessary criteria is if it is a metallic thin film, for example, or adequately rigid thin film, then despite being thermodynamically unstable, nothing will happen because it does not evolve. Because this growth of this fluctuation requires physical movement of material and which is far favored or which is much favored in a liquid and not in a solid. So is it what type of liquid this type of phenomena is possible? Well, this type of phenomena is possible in any liquid, in water, in organic solvents, everywhere. But we do not typically do the experiments with uh, classical liquids. We prefer to do the experiments with polymers. The reason for that is as follows. So what type of polymer is chosen? We typically choose a glassy polymer, which are these uh, long chain polymers, which are entangled, but they are not physically cross-linked. So what happens is these polymers, if you heat up above their glass transition temperature, 
you can sort of take them to a liquid state. So you now have an ultra thin film, it's in a liquid state, so the film can evolve, right? And so polymer has a very low vapor pressure, so the possibility of evaporation is also eliminated. One of the key problem of working with a regular liquid is that there will be evaporation and since, since thickness is a very important criteria in this whole physics, so there will be a constant change in the film thickness and quantification, scientific quantification becomes extremely difficult, right? So there are certain details I have written. Generally, spin coating is used for uh, obtaining such uh, films of such low thickness. Also by this uh, technique, it becomes possible to obtain films on non wettable surfaces. Films at room temperature are glassy, which are solid-like. And even if the film is thermodynamically unstable, nothing will happen. When the film is taken to the liquid state by heating above the glass transition temperature or exposing to its solvent vapor, it starts to evolve. And another thing is just, just the way when I was playing this video, I can sort of pause it anywhere. You can exactly do the same thing with these polymers because if you are heating it above the glass transition temperature, you may not wait for the complete evolution to happen. You can just take it out of the, out of the heating, just do a room uh, quenching to the room temperature or take out of the solvent vapor chamber and the evolution will stop, right? So this is uh, the area of the spontaneous instability or hydrodynamic instability in ultra thin films. Why the word hydrodynamic? because this evolution take, requires a liquid or takes place in a liquid thin film. And uh, this whole area sort of started to emerge with the pioneering contribution of Gunter Reiter in 1992. So that way this area is not very old. It's about 30 years now. And it's with this physical review letters paper, the whole area started. Now I will finish in about five to six minutes more. So the question is now we understand that if we take an ultra thin film, and it is in a liquid form, there is a possibility that this film can wet, can spontaneously wet. In fact, uh, we can all correlate to a very simple example. That is uh, whenever a painter is coating uh, on walls, we always tell put two or three coat layers. So we feel that this is going to make the paint or the wall look brighter. Well, our forefathers actually did not know this much amount of physics, but they realized that if you have a single layer coating, the possibility is that the thickness of the layer might be too low and eventually this layer might disintegrate following exactly the same physics, right? So this is why you need to go for a slightly thicker layer. Uh, of course, there are coatings, there are application areas where you'd like to have a thinner coating. One example is the spectacles, most of which now contains some, some sort of coating, anti-reflection, anti-smear, uh, uh, this, that. And you really would not like to make it very thick because the ethical layer will absorb some amount of light. But because of this fear of spontaneous instability, none of these coatings are very, very thin. You never go for a uh, coating, which is like 50 nanometer or 100 nanometer, because there is always a possibility of such a film might eventually degrade over time. So a simple question like this physics of spontaneous instability and debating that we talked about, is it good or bad? Well, in a way it's good because it allows us to make some uh, structures like I will talk about it, but it significantly hinders the application as ultra thin coatings. Why I say it's good, like you start off with a continuous film and eventually the video you saw, you can get large number of these type of structures. And I think the scale bar here is five micron or something. So these are all like 500, 600 nanometer size, nearly equal sized uh, spherical droplets. So these are some nanostructures. There might be some optical consequences or other type of consequences. And by any top-down or bottom-up approach or by lithographic approach, making these structures will take large amount of investment and time. So of course, this is a viable route for making some nanostructures, right? And people have used these type of debating mediated structures. There is an ACS Nano in 2011 uh, where they have enhanced the um, photoluminescence of some material. Uh, Chiara Neto from Australia has been using these structures for water harvesting. And even from our group, actually, we used uh, some of these structures for making, uh, for using as a mask for growing titania nano rods, and uh, with which we could eventually make them modulate the weightability of this nano rod array with controlling the porosity of the array on the, on the, on the surface by means of where these uh, deweighted droplets were. So that allowed us to make some a holy titania nanorod array, which led to structural hydrophobicity. And with that, with my collaborator, Professor Samitre's group, we could demonstrate a uh, uh, water stable self-powered 
UV detector, right? So, so th there are there are potential applications of these type of deviated structures also. Though, please do understand that this type of spontaneous instability is extremely undesirable from the standpoint of coating applications. Uh, so there are other things like there is another very interesting thing that we did um, recently. Like when I said that you take a polymer film and you can you have to take it to the liquid form uh, for this evolution to take place. So there are traditionally two approaches by which people used to do. One is by uh, thermal annealing, simply heating the film above its glass transition temperature. The other one was by exposing it to its solvent vapor where the solvent molecules penetrated and uh, so there was a reduction in viscosity or the reduction in the cohesive interaction between the molecules leading to an effective reduction of the glass transition temperature to below room temperature. However, people in this whole area always use these two approaches as almost interchangeably. So there was nobody looked into, is there a fundamental difference in the mechanism or the physics of the debating system? So we looked into it recently and we actually showed that uh, Though we say that we, in both the approaches, we take the film to a higher temperature, uh, there is actually significant difference in the way the film actually undergoes debating. Uh, so I have the reference a little later. The other approach of this uh, spontaneous instability, this is something that I have been doing for a long time. Uh, some of my friends might be bored with these slides because you can, instead of debating a film on a flat surface, you can debate it on a topographically patterned surface or a chemically patterned surface and can create different type of ordered structures. So you just take a grating and over that you do the debating. So essentially it's the literal confinement mediated ordering of this otherwise disordered structures. So from isotropic structures to anisotropic structures, you can make there are a whole lot of work we have in this area. So for example, this was a very interesting work where we could actually create an alternate droplet array of two different polymers leading to some sort of a clue for making multi multifunctional uh, surfaces or structures and things like that. Uh, this also uh, essentially is a more recent work uh, where we had a bilayer, polymer bilayer. I'm not going into the physics of that because that might be too heavy for this uh, to wind up in half an hour's time. So some of these things. But as uh, I asked a question, so is it good or bad? Please do understand that it hinders application of ultra thin films as coating. So there has been tremendous amount of research starting from a pioneering macromolecules from Professor Alamgir Karim's group in 2000 on how to suppress the instability in these type of ultra thin films. And one simple strategy to do so is to add some nanoparticles. So the first paper they demonstrated was by adding some fullerene nanoparticles. And they could show that a film which would otherwise become unstable with the addition of fullerene nanoparticles in trace amount, the film does not debate anymore. So there is a lot of uh, controversy and ongoing research on to what exactly happens. So finally, I mean, people concluded that uh, we also did some work, I'm coming to it, that probably these nanoparticles eventually migrate through the polymer matrix to the film substrate interface and they get anchored there like this. So this particle is within the polymer matrix. They migrate to the, uh, the substrate and release a polymer chain. And eventually they change in situ the weighting property. Now the question to ask is why do they migrate? Uh, well, it turns out probably there is an entropic uh, driving force because a polymer chain that is attached to the surface is actually quite restricted in terms of its conformal entropy. And so if a particle migrates to the surface or the substrate surface or interface gets attached and simultaneously releases a polymer chain, there is actually a gain in the conformational entropy of the polymer chain. So this is considered to be the driving force. For a long time, there was no direct evidence. I mean, microscopically, you see that uh, the film remains stable, but what exactly was happening to these nanoparticles, nobody knew. So we looked into, we also started to look into this system for a while and we looked into the different effects of the surface energy of the substrate, the filler particles, how they influence and we came up with some regime maps, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is a, also a recent work which I was talking about uh, where we showed the difference between nanoparticle containing film, uh, where, where we showed the difference between uh, how the deweighting mechanism if it is done by, uh, thermal annealing versus uh, solvent vapor exposure. And there is also another interesting thing we found out, which we found that there was no attention to it at all, 
that every paper which talks about this nanoparticle mediated stabilization talks about the stabilization happens after a critical concentration of nanoparticles. So be at lower concentration, the film still divides. So we were the first one to look into what happens at these low nanoparticle concentration films. And we figured out that, well, the, you can actually modulate the features and stuff like that. And it also depends on the solvent vapor, whether you are following a solvent vapor mediated route or a thermal annealing mediated route and things like that. So all this, uh, you can find the details over here. The benefit of time, I will skip these details. We could also stabilize, maybe this is one interesting slide. We could also stabilize a polymer bilayer, which is a slightly more complicated system. And as I was telling, so we use some gold nanoparticles. So microscopically, you see that the film gets stabilized. But we did some XRR measurements in a synchrotron in Japan, and we could actually show that these nanoparticles, because of the centropic effects, actually migrate to two different interfaces. Uh, one is to the free surface, and one is to the polymer substrate interface. And uh, because of different reasons, so free surface, it sort of strengthens. Polymer surface interface, it sort of changes the wettability. It even stabilizes a bilayer. So like it's a stacked layer of two ultra thin films, both of which are liable to become unstable. So I think uh, at the end of this pretty disappointing talk, because there are no applications, which is order of the day. I think what we talked about, we understood what is an ultra thin film. And in ultra thin film, there is excess free energy due to interfacial van der Waals interaction. Depending on the strength and magnitude of the interaction, the disjoining pressure, the liquid uh, film may become unstable. Polymer is an interesting model system and not a regular liquid because you have evaporation. Another thing I forgot to tell, that if you use a polymer which is solid at room temperature, you can go for this higher resolution microscopies like atomic force microscope and scanning electron microscope, which is otherwise also not possible with a liquid, right? And the deweighted polymer features can be used for mask and other applications, though deweighting is completely undesired from the standpoint of ultra thin coatings. And therefore there is a lot of effect on uh, nanoparticle mediated suppression of this instability. So I'd like to thank my students, uh, particularly three former students, Nandini, Sudeshna, and Anuja. They contributed significantly, my collaborators, Professor AKR, Professor Alamgir Karim, and funding from Nanomission and SARB Star uh, Thank you very much, Sriparna, Praveen, and all others for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mukherjee. Uh, I know actually half of our duration is not justified. And I must tell you that uh, whenever I hear you, I always envy IIT Kharagpur students uh, because they have that opportunity to have your lecture in classroom. <laughs> so whenever I hear you, I always learn something new and it's just wonderful. But anyway, so there are a lot of uh, students. So <clears throat> I would um, uh, just ask all these students you please feel free to ask any sort of question. And um, one more thing uh, I would like to say that here we have many attendees from Bangladesh. So if you feel that you want to ask your question in Bangla, you can ask because uh, uh, Professor Mukherjee uh, is <laughs> Bengali. So just feel free, just ask your question. So. Um, Ananya, uh, have you unmuted all, all the participants? Yes, ma'am, all are unmuted now. Okay. Uh, I have asked all of them. Uh, since they will uh, click the button on the screen, they'll be unmuted. Okay, so I think- So, I have some question. Yeah, so I see the question, effect of substrate preparation, seeding epitaxy on diverting surface features. Well, Dr. Shubro, I do not work on epitaxy, but I do soft lithography, so patterning. And of course, so uh, if you have a textured surface or a pattern surface, what you can essentially trigger is the point where you'd like to have the initial instability that you can dictate. So you can have instability on demand and that eventually alters the, so it's a sort of an epitaxy, you can say, that you can guide the instability pathway based on the presence of the patterns, yeah. Yeah, uh, Professor Basit, I think you have some question or anything. We want to hear it from you. Yeah, yeah, I can hear the No, I don't have any question. Actually, it's a bit wonderful talk. Actually, I enjoyed the talk truly, and my students are there. So I, I don't have any question. Just, um, uh, I think uh, just one thing I may uh, want to know a little bit more. So, uh, uh, Professor Ravibhuta um, uh, Mukherjee, uh, just uh, about the stability. I mean, you have enhanced the stability by adding nanoparticles. So I was just thinking, suppose uh, the thin film, uh, 
the material for the thin film is one type of material. So what would be the uh, materials for our nanoparticles? Suppose if it is a magnetic nanoparticle, then the case may be very complex, I, I think, because there are some different sort of interaction and interface properties would be different. So there should have a very particular choice of the uh, properties of the materials of the nanoparticles, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, very, very good question. Hello, Achan Ashakuri. So, uh, yeah, as of now, people have uh, essentially the nanoparticles, of course, the compatibility of the nanoparticles with the polymer chains is itself an issue. So the way we make for samples is very simple. You just take a polymer solution, a very dilute one, and then add some nanoparticles, do something, maybe sonication or something so that it remains uh, sta stable, dispersed, right? So there is one fundamental question to ask that even when you are casting a film, uh, which contains the polymer as well as the nanoparticle, whether there is an immediate phase separation during casting itself. Because please do not forget that uh, skin coating is a non-equilibrium process and there is very rapid evaporation of the solvent. And I, we have a 2021 Langmuir where we show that, yeah, that though people consider that the initial film is totally uniform, it's not exactly like that. Coming to your question, you have actually given lead to a very interesting uh, point if you have magnetic nanoparticles, my take is that uh, for normal experiments, probably the magnetic nanoparticles, if they are compatible with the polymer chains, they will behave in a very similar way. But now if you are looking at a stability, uh, not only at an elevated temperature or in under solvent vapor, but also under a magnetic field, probably mm -hmm. you will see something co completely extraordinary. I know few groups who have been talking about this. Some of them touched base with me for doing this, but nobody has done it so far very, very important area. One can actually, uh, what you can do is that you can place the magnetic field in such a way, you can mm -hmm. override the thermodynamics driven migration of these nanoparticles within the polymer matrix. Mm -hmm. I, uh, so something can be done. I, I don't know exactly, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Abhivata. And thank you, Professor Sriparna, for inviting us. Uh, we enjoyed it totally, truly. And in future, we'll, uh, yeah, we must join in other, other events. Thank you. Thanks once again. Yeah, so if possible, please stay with us for uh, uh, Prachi's talk as mm, well. Of, of course. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. sure, sure. So, uh, so anyone else? Uh, I okay, see. Uh, yeah, please. I please. have a couple of questions, okay? So maybe one or two I can ask here. Very interesting talk, okay? I really uh, I would have loved, loved Praveen not asking me questions, but anyway, what is the point in exposing no, no. The, that your speaker does not have adequate knowledge? Anyway, go ahead. Come on, come on, Professor. Yeah, I, I have a follow-up question of uh, Professor Basit. Like uh, where you are talking about uh, these nanoparticles, uh, you know, uh, mixing with the well, do, uh, do I think? So what about the defects and dislocations? Okay. So are they going to hamper the quality of the layers which you are going to grow? Well, uh, I have no idea. Probably no, because here there are no layer-wise deposition. It's not something like ALD. So it's pin coating, it's all at once. So typically what people think that uh, what you get is a is in, in a way a nanocomposite thin film. So you have a polymer matrix and it's all uh, polymer chains are entangled and somewhere the nanoparticles are. Uh, more than that, uh, actually, you can take the nanoparticle in slightly different ways. Or generally, there can be two broad type of nanoparticles. One is the functional nanoparticles where you can sort of make them compatible. Like you can have some brushes so that it becomes compatible with the polymer chains. The other can be the bare nanoparticles. They are just stabilized with some surfactant molecules and they have no preferential affinity. If you look at Joydeep Basu's work in IIC Bangalore, he works with this uh, functionalized nanoparticles. So there the movement sort of is partly constricted because, because of the compatibility of the brushes with the polymer chains, the nanoparticles really cannot move through the entanglement or the diffusion sort of becomes restricted. But Praveen, exactly what you asked, I do not know. I have no idea uh, regarding but the I layering. My answer. Thank you. But you can look into our uh, 2021 macro macromolecules, what is happening that in addition, the scattering actually shows that in addition to the stabilization, the nanoparticles actually are layering up because of a self-assembly process, right? So whether that has any optical consequence, I have no idea. There might be some. Thank you. Thank you. I think, Subana, you can go ahead. Uh, okay. So I don't see any hands uh, raised uh, or like... Yeah, yeah Dr. Saripanna. Uh, yeah. Hello. 
Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, this is uh, Anil Kumar Chauve from uh, CSR IMMT Bureau, sir. Uh, just, uh, yeah, I'm audible. Yes, you are okay. audible. Please go ahead. Anil. Yeah, Professor Mukherjee, uh, actually, it was very nice uh, 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 talk. Uh, but, uh, uh, and uh, I have some uh, uh, other uh, question, uh, not just related to the talk, because you are, uh, uh, you are uh, uh, the chairman of this uh, Sathi Center. So can you just uh, give a small uh, highlight, what are the facilities uh, there at uh, your center and how we, uh, we can, uh, uh, we, we want some experimental facility to use and how we can use. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, Thanks, Dr. Chobe. So uh, let me also tell you, uh, I will be happy to answer this question because I'm not only the Sathi chairman, I was also a CSI scientist for 12 long years. I was a scientist in CGCRI before I shifted to IIT Kharagpur. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. so uh, Sathi is actually, a, uh, you can say, it's a national instrument facility, but it's not aimed only for academia. Uh, the DST essentially envisages to uh, bring in industry, startup, everybody to use this on a payment basis. So as of now, only three instruments have been approved for our Sathi Center, which will be functional by end of the year. One is a HR temp, better than the one you have got from GEOL recently, because this is a double aberration corrected. And we are heavily looking at the installation that has been made at IMMT. I know that. Uh, we are getting a type of flight seams for surface analysis, and we are getting a high temperature uh, environment controlled UTM to start with. Uh, eventually, there's, in the second phase, we have some other instruments lined up. I'll be share, happy to talk to you regarding this, maybe offline at some other appropriate opportunity. And I think I'm visiting uh, Bhubaneswar for an industry meet in August, so I will be more than happy to visit IIT. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, have you any uh, bigger press facility for a hot, hot molding press? Like, uh... Uh, as of now, not through Sati, but I'm sure our metallurgy colleagues will be having it. Uh, you can just drop me a mail and I will connect you to the right person. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, so thank you, Rohit Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, okay.